Here's an example of a past exam question, and I'm going to do part of it in this video. The basic idea is that we've got a sloping surface here, straight line sloping surface, with some oil on the surface. And that oil accelerates and eventually reaches an equilibrium between the gravity that's pulling it down the slope and the friction that's holding it back, so that this depth becomes constant. And what we'd like to know is, given the properties of the oil and the air up here, how much oil actually runs down this slope, uh, given the, the geometry that's involved. So suppose we measure this thickness here, and we figure out that that height is 0 0.005 meters, i.e. 5 millimeters. So we've measured that thickness. We'd like to know how much oil is flowing off the end here. The first thing we need to know is what does the velocity of the oil look like? So just by examination, at this surface there'll be a no-slip condition. So at the surface the velocity will be zero. Up here at the free surface with the air we could make the approximation, and it tells you so in the question that we can get away with it, that there's no friction between the air and the oil, or at least that the friction's negligible. So this will be moving at some velocity out here. And in between, we expect to see a velocity distribution that looks something like that. Low velocity close to the plate, higher velocity out here at the free surface. But let's try and use our uh, fundamental equations to figure out what this velocity profile ought to look like. So first, the continuity equation tells us that the divergence of velocity is equal to zero. And we can make some assumptions about this flow. First, let's assume that it extends a long way in the z-direction so that there's nothing changing in the z-direction. It's a two-dimensional flow. So dy w dy z is going to be zero because it's a two-dimensional flow. And now, let's not worry about the section up here where the depth is changing and the velocities are changing and so on. Let's assume we get down here to where the depth is staying constant and the velocity profile is staying constant. So that the velocity here and the velocity here are the same. And the velocity profile is the same as you go along in x. So that means that there's no change in the u velocity as we go in the x direction. The flow is what we call fully developed. That leaves us with just dy v dy y is equal to zero, and the solution to that is that v is equal to a constant. But down here at the surface, v equals zero at y equals zero. That's a boundary condition. So v equals zero everywhere. That makes our lives easier. So we've got a 2D fully developed flow. We're only looking at the region down here where the flow isn't changing as we go along in the x direction. And we've got some information out of the continuity equation, that is that the v velocity, the velocity of the y direction, is going to be equal to zero. Which if we do a physical examination, that makes sense too. Now, assuming this flow has been operating for a while, it's also going to be a steady flow. And gravity is gravity on Earth, so gravity is operating downwards. So in a direction that's neither the y direction nor the x direction, but some direction down this way. But aligning our coordinate system this way makes our solution easier to do. Now, this is the Navier-Stokes equation for conservation of x momentum. That's momentum in the x direction. I've written this one down. There are two other Navier-Stokes equations, one for motion in the z direction and one for motion in the y direction. The Navier-Stokes equation for motion in the y direction becomes pretty boring because all of the v velocity terms, that is every term in the equation, is zero except for the pressure and gravity terms and that just tells us that the pressure is higher down here under the oil than it is up here at the air surface.
So the Navier-Stokes equation for y momentum tells us nothing interesting. Because it's two-dimensional, likewise the one for z momentum tells us nothing interesting. So we're left with the one for x momentum, the momentum associated with velocities in this direction. And for an incompressible flow, it looks like this. And this was also for an incompressible flow only, so we better make that as one of our assumptions. Our flow is incompressible. Like just about all of the flows that we'll cover in this course. And we've made the assumption that it's steady. We've also assumed that it's two-dimensional and fully developed. Meaning that it doesn't change as we go along in the x direction. So we can, I hope, simplify this Navier-Stokes equation to something that we may be able to solve. So first off, it's incompressible, so we can use this equation rather than the compressible version. It's steady, so the time derivative is zero. It's two-dimensional, so nothing interesting is happening in the z direction, and the w component of velocity is zero. So that one will go away because it's two-dimensional. And this one will go away because it's two-dimensional. So we're left with only x and y components. Now from here we already know that v is equal to zero because it's fully developed. So that term will go away because v here is equal to zero. It's fully developed so u is not changing as we go along in the x direction. That di u di x term is zero. So that'll go away because it's fully developed. The pressure. Is the pressure changing in the x direction? Is the derivative of pressure with x uh, non-zero? Well, if we're up at the surface here, we're at atmospheric pressure there and atmospheric pressure there. If we're down at the plate surface here, we're at atmospheric pressure plus some amount due to the depth under the oil. And likewise here, atmospheric pressure plus that same amount due to the depth of the oil, because the depth of the oil is the same. We got that out of our, our V momentum equation. It's a pretty boring conclusion. Pressure matches gravity. So, uh, pressure is constant with X. There's no pressure gradient. in the x direction. Gravity in the x direction, there's some component of gravity acting this way. It's going downhill. If di u di x is equal to zero from our fully developed assumption, then di 2 u di x squared is also going to be equal to zero from our fully developed assumption. So we got rid of just about the entire equation. We're left with this viscous shear term due to the variation of the u velocity in the y direction. That's this profile variation. And gravity. And they have to balance out. So we've gone from a fairly complex equation to a much simpler one. And if I rearrange that, I'll wind up with di 2u di y squared. That's this one here equal to negative g in the x direction, because this has gone to the other side of the equal sign, divided by the kinematic viscosity. Now given our geometry, this g of x is a constant, and if our fluid remains the same, then our kinematic viscosity is a constant. So this is just saying the second derivative is equal to a constant. We can integrate that. If we integrate once, we'll get di u di y equal to negative g of x over nu times y plus some constant of integration c1. But we've got a boundary condition, and our boundary condition says that di u, di y, 
is equal to 0 at y equal to h. Why is this true? Well, the shear stress, we were told there was no friction up here at the boundary between the air and the oil. So if there's going to be no friction, then the velocity gradient has to be zero. That shear stress would be tau di u di y, or sorry, mu di u di y, viscosity times velocity gradient, tau equal to mu di u di y. If that's going to be zero, then the velocity gradient up there has to be zero. This has to come up and then just approach a constant value up here. If that's going to be true, we can substitute that in and we wind up with C1 equal to H times G at X over nu in order to make that equal to zero. This is negative G of X over nu times Y at H C1 has to be positive g of x over nu times y at h to give us this value equal to zero. So we've got di u di y equal to g of x over nu times a positive h and a negative y. If we integrate that again, we can get u equal to g of x over nu, that's just a constant, times h times y minus y squared over 2, plus another constant, c2. But we've got another boundary condition. Down here at the plate, there'll be no slip. The velocity will be equal to zero. So u is equal to zero at y equal to zero. When we're at y equal to zero down here at the plate, the fluid's not moving. So C2 equals zero. We wind up with u equal to g of x over nu times hy minus y squared over 2. Now what does that look like on an xy plot? If that's y, and this is the x velocity, u, then at y equals 0, u equals 0. At y equals h, we get to some positive value. The gradient of velocity here is equal to zero because that's the boundary condition we applied up here. And this parabolic curve applies so that we see a velocity profile that looks something like this as we get up to the surface. Highest velocity at the surface, a parabolic profile and the highest shear stress down here at the wall, going from zero shear stress, zero gradient up here, down to the highest shear stress down here at the surface of the wall. So that gets a, solu a solution for this velocity profile. If we know the velocity profile here, and we know the distance that this flow extends in the z direction, then we can use that velocity profile to integrate to get the total flow rate. And that'll be the next, uh, next step in the solution.